In the last unit, we looked in some detail at how Native American cultures in eastern North America developed during prehistory. In this unit, we'll look at how cultures evolved in Mexico, concentrating especially on the various different civilizations and how they adopted different strategies for dealing with the unique challenges of the Mexican landscape. First, it's useful to review the geographic setting for Mesoamerica. Recall that Mesoamerica means literally Middle America, but that it is not synonymous with Central America. Mesoamerica stretches from north-central Mexico south into Honduras. Central America is to the south of that, and the American Southwest is to the north. All Mesoamerican cultures are tied together through a variety of shared cultural traits that developed across the region throughout prehistory. Much like the eastern woodlands in North America, Mesoamerica can be thought of as an interaction sphere. Though the various cultures were not always peers with one another, and relationships were not always between equals. Some of the most important traits that unify Mesoamerican culture in general are the shared calendrical system, which combined the 365 day long solar year with a 260 day long ritual calendar, hieroglyphic writing, though various cultures all developed their own particular systems, a strong focus on astronomy and astronomical phenomena, and a team sport played with a solid rubber ball, though again different cultures apparently had their own versions. All of these cultural traits can be found quite early on in Mexico, as well as elsewhere in Mesoamerica. We'll be focusing exclusively on Mexico, mostly because of time constraints, but many of the same sorts of cultural processes can be seen in the Yucatan and farther south. The Mexican portion of Mesoamerica can be thought of as comprising three different environmental regions, each with its own distinct cultural traditions and adaptations. Highland Mexico and the Valley of Mexico proper, uh, in the region surrounding modern Mexico City, is an area of high elevation, much of it over uh, 900 meters above sea level. There are cool temperatures and forests. The Valley of Oaxaca and adjacent areas are semi-arid, bordering on true desert, with higher temperatures and sparser native vegetation. Finally, coastal Mexico, southern Veracruz and Tabasco states, are low-lying, swampy, tropical environments covered by dense rainforest vegetation. The southeast transitions into the broad, flat Yucatan Peninsula, which is the homeland of the Maya, Mesoamerican peoples whom we won't be studying. All of these regions, however, share a dry winter and a wet summer climate cycle, and relatively warm average temperatures. Chronologically, the history of Mexico can be divided into these periods. The Paleo-Indian period, before 7000 BC, the Archaic, from 7000 to 1800 BC, the Pre-Classic, from 1800 BC to AD 150, the Classic, from AD 150 to 900, and the Post-Classic, from AD 900 to 1519. Everything after 1519 belongs to the historic period. Now the Paleo-Indian period we touched on toward the beginning of the course. Today we'll look at the archaic and pre-classic periods of Mexican history. The archaic period in Mexico is, in some ways, quite similar to the archaic period in North America. Native American cultures were organized as small, highly mobile bands of hunter-gatherers. Relationships were egalitarian, and the largest communities were only a couple dozen people at most. Because of the greater variety of environments in Mexico, however, the adaptations of these hunter-gatherers were more varied than we saw in North America, with the highlands and lowlands adopting different strategies. Mobility remained high in both regions, however, and populations grew slowly over the 5,200 years of the Archaic. As in North America, probably the biggest cultural advance during this period was the domestication of food crops and the adoption of agriculture. Whereas agriculture developed slowly in North America, however, and only came to be the majority of Native Americans' diets much later, in Mesoamerica, agriculture caught on relatively quickly and spread to become the dominant subsistence strategy by the beginning of the Pre-Classic. This is because of the different crops that were available for domestication in Mexico when compared to the eastern woodlands of North America. Many more plants were suitable for domestication, 
and several of them were much more productive. The earliest domesticate in Mexico was the cucurbit, as in North America. Bruce Smith, in his exploration of the container revolution, identified bottle gourd rinds in Mexico as early as 8000 BC, even before the beginnings of the Archaic period. Most domesticates did not appear until much later, however, and undeniably the most important of those was maize. Maize was the most productive cereal crop on earth today, but it did not start out that way. Remember that domestication is a process whereby humans change a plant genetically to make it reliant on human cultivation. Much debate has been expended uh, to identify which wild plant is the ancestor of domesticated maize, and the best candidate is teosinte, a grass found growing wild throughout much of highland Mexico. Evidence suggests it was exploited heavily by hunter-gatherers very early in the Archaic, and their, ten and their tending led to an increased size of teosinte kernels throughout the period. As humans concentrated on the increasingly reliable and plentiful teosinte, they continued to encourage larger and larger grains, eventually developing cobs similar in size to the baby corn served in Chinese restaurants today. This is the earliest domesticated maize, and it dates to 5000 BC or so, or slightly later, throughout Mexico. Later, as Mexican communities became more and more tied to their maize fields, they also domesticated other crops to replace the wild foods that were now outside of their now sedentary reach. The most important of those other crops was the bean, uh, which with maize and squash, completed the triumvirate of Mexican agriculture. All three crops, of course, would eventually make their way into North America and replace the native domesticates there. Overall, the archaic period in Mexico can be seen as quite similar in many ways to comparable periods uh, throughout the world. As hunter-gatherers became more reliant on cultivated food sources, their mobility went down and their population went up. These demographic shifts drove the cultural changes that led to increasingly complex uh, societies and the eventual appearance, in Mexico at least, of states. Recall, of course, that states never evolved in the eastern woodlands of North America. The most complex societies found there, prior to European colonization, were the Mississippian chiefdoms. In Mexico, however, we see a relatively short period of potential chiefdom-organized societies scattered around the region during the late Archaic. These remain in place in much of Mexico during the Pre-Classic period, but in some parts of Mexico, the Pre-Classic finds the emergence of states. A state, to review, is the largest and most socially complex form of human society. They are always fed through intensive agriculture, maize agriculture in this case, and usually have cities and a writing system. States are governed by a bureaucratic noble class which has the authority and power to coerce or demand the obedience of the populace. With the exception of cities, we see all of these traits first appear in the Mexican archaeological record in the Olmec culture. The Olmecs are the first true civilization in Mesoamerica, arising on the lowland coastal plain of Veracruz and Tabasco states around 1800 BC, the start of the pre-classic period. While their civilization is recognized as state, it does not have any bona fide cities. Instead, the Olmec state seems to have been governed from administrative ceremonial centers where just a few select nobles lived, with most of the populace dispersed in the surrounding landscape. This is an adaptation to the marshy environment, where densely packed urban settlements would be unable to acquire enough food to support themselves. Nevertheless, the biggest sites in the Olmec heartland, assumed to be the capitals of the Olmec state, are still impressively large settlements. The earlier capital, San Lorenzo, dates to the early Preclassic, about 1800 to 1200 BC, and La Venta follows in the middle Preclassic, about 1200 to 400 BC. If most of the Olmec population was scattered in dispersed farmsteads and only came together at these ceremonial centers occasionally, what makes us think that the Olmec culture was a unified state? 
Well, primarily the Olmec artistic style and the religious ideology that it depicts. The iconography of Olmec art is too standardized, too formalized and controlled to have been left up to the choices of artists working independently. They must have been directed and controlled by a strong central authority. The most recognizable images from the Olmec canon are those of the Ware Jaguar baby, a human infant whose facial features incorporate jaguar traits like sharp teeth. This baby's head is also often bifurcated, split into two parts. Iconographic analysis of this and related styles suggests that the infant is a maize deity connected with plentiful harvests and fertility. Other Olmec deities are similarly standardized in their depictions, though less common. All of them incorporate elements of dangerous or fierce animals, the caiman, the eagle, the shark, and so forth. Other very recognizable Olmec artistic forms are the colossal heads and altars found at major Olmec sites. The colossal heads are large boulders, some as large as three meters high, carved all around to represent the faces of Olmec rulers. The rulers were, wear helmets reminiscent of the protective gear worn by ball players in later periods, though these helmets could also be military attire, or both, considering the military associations that the ball game had in later periods. While the colossal heads are round sculptures, the Olmec altars are more cube-shaped, usually carved on all sides, with a flat, smooth top, these large stone sculptures are probably not altars in the sense that they were used to make offerings during religious rituals. A more likely interpretation is that they served as thrones, or platforms, on which rulers sat while conducting the business of government. Their locations, decorations, and so forth suggest this. As the first civilization in Mesoamerica, the Olmec state is ultimately the source of many of the traits that would later come uh, to be typical of Mesoamerican cultures. It's here that hieroglyphic writing was first used, though the Olmec version of this script is still undeciphered. The Olmec also began the long tradition of Mesoamerican calendars, though in an even more sophisticated manner than elsewhere in Mexico. As I said earlier, Mesoamerica in general followed a calendar that combined a 365-day solar cycle, much like our own calendar, with a 260-day ceremonial cycle. Since both cycles ran simultaneously, their dates interlocked like teeth on gears. This created a larger 52-year cycle. A particular day on the 365-day calendar would only line up with a particular day on the 260-day calendar once every 52 years. This calendar is thus called the calendar round because it measures time in repeating 52-year cycles. The Olmec followed this calendar but added to it another system. They invented the long count, a calendrical system that simply counted how many days had elapsed since a starting point. This is more similar to how we number years, counting from the birth of Jesus forward in a linear fashion. In later periods, the long count calendar was rare in other parts of Mexico, but the classic Maya picked up on it, and thanks to their nearly obsessive astronomical record keeping, we can correlate the long count with our own calendar with great confidence. For reasons that we don't know, the Olmec chose to start counting days on August 13th, 3114 BC, more than a thousand years prior to the earliest days of their own civilization. Perhaps this was a significant day to their mythology, the birth of the were-jaguar baby, or even the creation of the earth. Regardless, the origins of the long count seem to have come quite late in the Olmec civilization, not long before the Olmec culture gave way to other, later cultures. The earliest dates yet recovered from Olmec sites are September 3rd, 32 BC, and December 8th, 36 BC. Though, of course, we don't know what happened on those dates because we can't read the hieroglyphics alongside them. Let's turn now and look at several of the important Olmec sites. The earliest large Olmec site is San Lorenzo, long assumed to be the first capital of the Olmec state. It was first settled around 1700 BC and abandoned around 1200 BC. Its change of fortune may have been due to the shifting of nearby river courses, 
that made travel to and from the site difficult. San Lorenzo has yielded ten of the colossal head sculptures, suggesting a long line of ruling kings, and it also had sophisticated urban infrastructure like aqueducts and drainage. The succeeding capital of the Olmecs was La Venta, which was first settled right around 1200 BC as San Lorenzo was abandoned. It seems likely that the seat of government simply moved from one site to the other. The site was finally abandoned, probably due to a violent military defeat and overthrow, about 400 BC. La Venta is a larger, more complex site than San, Lore San Lorenzo, reflecting a more developed, more sophisticated society. Its centerpiece is a massive clay pyramid 34 meters high, two long embankments, an enclosed ceremonial ground, and another massive mound. To construct and maintain such huge earthen features in this tropical environment, and to feed the large population of nobles and bureaucrats that must have lived there, the surrounding landscape must have had at least 18,000 farmers and laborers. Other important Olmec sites include El Manati, a lowland site that was waterlogged, which prevented the decay of organic materials. Thus, El Manati has artifacts preserved that have long since rotted away at other sites. It gives us invaluable information on Olmec woodworking, and it proves the existence of the Mesoamerican ball game at this early period, thanks to the preservation of the balls themselves. Outside of the Veracruz lowlands, Olmec influence on contemporary, but less complex, Mexican cultures was great. Scholars believe that these Olmec sites outside of the Olmec heartland were trade stations, where exotic goods were, obt were obtained by Olmec traders for export back to San Lorenzo or La Venta. One of the most important of these sites is Chalcatzingo, in the highlands south of the Valley of Mexico. Imagery at Chalcatzingo combines aspects of the classic Olmec style with more local styles, and one image shows a precursor of the god Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent who would become one of the most important deities of classical Mexico. While the Olmecs are the most influential pre-classic civilization in Mexico, by the late pre-classic, about 400 BC or so, civilizations had arisen elsewhere in the region. The most important of these was Monte Alban, in the Zapotec region of the Valley of Oaxaca. Founded about 500 BC, Monte Alban would go on to become one of the most important urban centers of the Classic period. It is located overlooking the juncture of three branches of the Valley of Oaxaca, giving it a prime opportunity to control trade in the region. Unfortunately, since Monte Alban remained occupied during later periods, Later construction destroyed most of the earliest archaeological record there. Consequently, we know relatively little about pre-classic Zapotec civilization. We do know, however, that the Zapotecs had already adopted the calendar round system, and were using it to record important events, such as the conquering of rival cities. The Zapotecs also had their own hieroglyphic writing, but in this early period they seem not to have used it for much more than recording place names of conquests. Only in later periods would the writing system become more sophisticated. It seems likely that the Mesoamerican tradition of human sacrifice was also already established at this time, as the Temple of the Danzantes, a pre-classic ceremonial platform in central Monte Alban, seems to depict sacrificial victims and enemy captives in its sculptured facade. This was the circumstance in Mexico at the end of the pre-classic period. Monte Alban in Oaxaca on its ascent, and the Olmec state in Veracruz on its decline. In the highlands, most settlements were much simpler and culture less expansive. This was all about to change with the onset of the classic period in A.D. 150. That's what we'll look at next week.